My name is Tim Vlanders. I'm an associate professor of social policy here at Oxford and also a fellow in St. Anthony's College. And this session examines the challenges for governments in paying for climate action. I think what's really interesting about this session is that it's really a multidimensional problem that we'll be exploring in the next hour or so. On the one hand, you have member states at the national level facing challenges, but you also have questions about the ideal framework at the EU level. Uh, and on the other hand, you also have an economic, political kind of trade-off or tensions, and we'll be exploring whether that's a real tension or whether we can uh, escape it. And so to stimulate our thinking on these crucial issues, we have three fantastic speakers lined up for a discussion in the next hour. We will follow uh, the order in which they appear uh, in the program, and we're going to uh, strive and do our best to keep 20 minutes at the end of the hour for the Q&A. Um, the first speaker will be Jean Pisani Ferry, who is a professor of economics uh, in Sciences Po Paris at the Hertie School of Governance, and also holds the chair, uh, Tommaso Padua Schioppa uh, at the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Dora Yakova, uh, who is the IMF Assistant Director leading the IMF work on European climate policies. And last but not least, we will have our, our very own a colleague from Oxford, Linus uh, Matausch, I hope I'm not torturing your name too much here, who is Deputy Director of Economics of Sustainability Program at the INET Institute uh, here in Oxford. So uh, without further ado, um, Jean, uh, the floor uh, is yours. Uh, and uh, if you get lost in the temporal void of the online format, I shall uh, intervene at some point uh, to remind you of the, of the timeline that we must uh, keep to. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for, for inviting me to this um, uh, to this seminar. Um, I'm not with Hertie School anymore, unfortunately. Uh, I love this school, but uh, I've left. Um, um, on the on the topics, um, I think it's a very timely debate we're having. So we're at a moment where the EU fiscal rule has been uh, suspended for good reasons. And the question is when we will go back to the fiscal framework, but also the question is what type of fiscal framework will be put in place? Will it be a reformed fiscal framework or will it be, will it be just the same? And I think a strong case for a variety of reasons uh, can be made for, for reforming the, the fiscal framework. So it's a very good uh, discussion to have now. Um, the starting point should be um, that the uh, decarbonization requires significant uh, increase in government spending on climate action. Uh, so we're speaking here of research, we're speaking of public buildings, we're speaking of infrastructure, we're speaking on renewables, we're speaking of support to households, especially to poor households who cannot afford to pay for the, the transformation of their housing uh, heating system or for a purchase of a different vehicle. And uh, we know from experience that this um, redistributive component is, is very important. How much money are we speaking of? It's hard to say exactly. Um, <clears throat> So the, 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 the estimate we should be starting from is the total increase in investment, private and public, which is you know, frequently put uh, to the order of magnitude of 2% of GDP, perhaps a little bit more. Um, what, how much is government spending? It's not only investment, because it will be in part transfers to households to help them you know, uh, undertake those investments. Uh, we're probably speaking of something like 0.5% to 1% of GDP. Uh, I'm speaking of the next decade, okay? Uh, and actually that uh, coincides with an estimate that has been made for, for France by the um, uh, Institute for, for Climate Economics. So that's the starting point. Now, um, what what are the incentives in the uh, EU fiscal uh, framework? So <clears throat> perhaps we should start from where, where, what's in place. And obviously what's in place is the next generation EU program, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, 
so we have this 30% share in uh, the total that's devoted to the transition. Um, and uh, furthermore, they are not only investment financed by the EU, but also these notions of bundles between investments and reforms. So that can uh, trigger, if it works well, uh, this, uh, these bundles can trigger adjustment in national policies in the direction also of, um, of climate action. For example, I think that you know, part of the discussion that should be taking place uh, is that uh, at the same time the EU provides funding for uh, green investment, it should be asking member states to align their domestic policies uh, with these objectives by you know, discontinuing fossil fuel subsidies, for example. So there should be some conditionality attached to the particular target of this um, uh, part of the, of the recovery and resilience uh, facility funding that would contribute to, to sort of change uh, national policies. So it's a, it's a welcome uh, effect. Now, how big can it be? We're speaking of, um, in total, so it, um, I'm, I'm putting together the, the part, the green part of the recovery and resilience facility, plus, plus the, the green uh, transition, the just uh, transition fund. We're speaking of 127 billion, uh, or 0.9% uh, of, of the GDP of the EU, spread over three to five years. So we're speaking of something like 0.2% of GDP on average, um, which is welcome, but it's not, you know, compared to the numbers I, I mentioned, it's certainly not a substitute. So we have to think about other type of uh, support. Now, then we have the, the flexibility rules within the stability and growth pact. So they do they exist. Um, um, and they exist because the impact of the fiscal framework on public investment in the EU um, has been significant. So we've seen reduction of investment in high debt countries, in countries under excessive deficit procedure, and especially obviously in program countries, countries um, you know, receiving assistance from the BS. So um, the way to correct the detrimental effect on public investment um, is a very legitimate question for, for policy. Now we have this investment clause that was introduced in 2015 in the Stability and Growth Pact that allows for some deviation from the adjustment past to what they, what's called the medium term objective to finance investment, I quote, with positive, direct and verifiable long-term effects on growth and the sustainability of public finances. So it's not specifically green, but it can be interpreted in this. way. Now, if you look at the number of conditions countries have to meet to uh, qualify for this exemption, um, it's very discouraging. And it's not by accident that only two countries applied for this uh, benefit of this investment clause. So the country has to be in bad times. So, you know, sub, uh, subnormal growth or, or recession. But at the same time, the deficit has to be safely below 3% of GDP. And the country has to be on track for, to, to reaching the medium term uh, structural balance objective. And there should be some co-financing from the uh, EU. And the adjustment, this sort of benefit is limited in, in magnitude uh, to 0.1% of, of, of GDP uh, uh, one. So it's a, it's a sort of, you know, the, it's exactly what shouldn't be done. So, so, you know, opening a window and then putting all uh, the conditions um, uh, that uh, prevent member states from, from using this, this uh, window. So this is completely, you know, without proportion uh, with what has to be done. It's a sort of marginal tweak that may uh, be, uh, you know, useful politically as a sort of signaling device, but uh, won't, certainly won't do the job. So what can be done? 
Um, I think in terms of more innovative approaches, um, there are uh, two things that can be uh, done. One is what I alluded to, is to use the potential for reforming the stability and growth pact, uh, the way to introduce uh, a preferential treatment uh, for a green investment in the stability and growth pact. Now, the rules have to be amended or reformed, uh, most probably reformed anyway, because of the high level of debt coming out of the COVID crisis and because of the low level of interest rates, which means that this is sort of the usual numerical benchmarks don't make much sense anymore. The debate on that uh, has barely started. Um, we, we had um, the suspension uh, the, of the, the general escape clause, um, and the ministers of finance are beginning to discuss how and when to end this exemption. So there is a debate, should the, um, the pact be reformed before the new rules are put in place, or should the existing rules be put back in force? And then um, uh, a discussion on reform should start. I think it would be preferable to choose the first option, but anyhow, the question of reforming the, the pact will be uh, discussed. Now, what could be done is certainly to have a more systematic definition of priorities, uh, among them green priorities, with the preferential treatment for investment in line with the common priorities in the stability and, and growth plan. So a sort of broader definition of sustainability that also includes the sustainable character of groups. Um, the question how to do it, I'm very convinced that the temptation to have a, an accounting treatment for a green uh, investment or for investment in general that would uh, sort of uh, create an exemption based on statistical criteria is not the way to go because um, it's hard to define uh, from an accounting standpoint exactly what's desired. Part of the spending we're speaking of has not uh, the character of an investment in a few use a sort of traditional accounting meaning of investment. Um, and part of the investment uh, is not necessarily desired. So it's, I think it would be much preferable to go for um, a process of qualification uh, of uh, labelization of investment that is in line with common priorities. You can imagine having for a certain period a series of common priorities. And so, you know, member states could present projects um, that are in line with those priorities. And if these projects are approved, corresponding spending would benefit from a preferential treatment in one way or, or another with respect to the fiscal rules. So that's one possibility. Um, now, the limit here is that uh, indebted countries, uh, governments, will be possibly quite reluctant to undertake um, investment anyway because of the fear of just increasing the level of, of debt. So we certainly in a number of member states, if we're speaking of, you know, a 20 percentage point uh, uh, increase in the debt to GDP ratio, and perhaps more, we're not yet out of this crisis, it may well be more. Uh, we may be reaching levels that will be frightening for, for member states, even in a context of, of low rates. So the question is whether there is some way of doing more and providing more incentives. And here, uh, and let me end with that, I think we can learn from the COVID response. What has been done or what is being done with the COVID crisis response? We in the process of, you know, inventing, experimenting 
a new model of fiscal federalism in the EU with national investment that's financed through loans or grants from uh, uh, the, the EU, or that's being supported by um, the ECB. Um, so it's an experiment. Success is not guaranteed, but that's what's happening. So it's fairly different from a traditional um, model in which member states were fully responsible, subject to rules that limited the scope for individual action. Here you have action at national level supported in different way by the EU, by the EU. And it's also different from the traditional model of having EU spending that completely separate from national policies. So we have, a, we have the, the, the template, the loan template, you know, sure, or, or the, uh, the, the, the loan component of the recovery and resilience facility. So you're, you're, you're being lent money, that's part of your, 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 your fiscal debt, but uh, with a special interest rate, a sort of mutualization of the cost. There is the, the recovery and resilience, uh, the grant template. So with a very strong redistributive component for the recovery and resilience facility, but not, not necessarily so. So it's basically that you're being given quote unquote grants, which are in fact not real grants because someone has to repay ultimately those, those grants. And since to the extent there are no increases in their own resources, in the, in eventually the member state will have to repay for these grants themselves through contribution to the EU budget. But that's not part of the, of the Maastricht debt and there is no sort of precise timetable um, that defines when this, uh, these grants have to be repaid. And we have uh, even, as I said, the, the, the PEP template, which is that uh, you know, the ECB um, is supporting, uh, de facto supporting um, action against the COVID crisis. But you could imagine, and the ECB, we know it, thinking about its own contribution and the integration of, uh, of uh, the green dimension in its own monetary policy or its asset purchases. We could even imagine something of the sort. Now, it raises all sorts of problems about whether it's um, in the mandate of the ECB, what that sort of distortion it may create, etc. But de facto, you know, that's part of the discussion, whatever uh, conclusion we, we may draw from it. So I think, um, you know, to conclude, uh, we're not speaking of an easy road. We're not speaking of something on which we have, you know, uh, ready uh, to use solutions. But certainly we have, we are in the process of experimenting and we can go beyond what uh, was uh, traditionally done in this field in order to support uh, green investment and contributing to the, to the Green Deal uh, transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jean, also for, for uh, relatively keeping to the time for this really thoughtful reflections on the, the different challenges for the EU institutional architecture and how we might want to use the recent experimentations, leverage them uh, to solve some of these issues. Um, without further ado, let me pass uh, the virtual mic to uh, Dora. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity uh, to, dis to discuss climate policies and uh, political and economic issues surrounding it with such an impressive group of panelists and hosts. Um, I would like to reiterate that uh, the European Green Deal has reaffirmed uh, the Europe's position as a global leader on climate action, and it demonstrated that Europe has the determination and the strength to implement the necessary policies. It is showing the rest of the world that it is possible to reduce emissions while achieving economic prosperity, and it has uh, already done so in, in the last uh, you know, 20 years, not, not only looking forward with its uh, ambitious goals. So the main question of this session is, is how can uh, governments um, and in general the society afford to make the large investments needed to implement the transition to a carbon neutral economy? And I, I know that I'm speaking to the converted, but, but just for a moment to, to provide a, a different perspective. Uh, the question 
can be uh, rephrased as, as can economies uh, afford not, not to make those investments? Uh, 2020 and 2016 were the two years on record with the highest average temperature. And I think five of the hottest years on record have been in the last 10 years. So we know that under unchanged policies, global temperatures will increase by an additional two to five degrees by the end of this century, imposing massive economic and health costs with high risk of dangerous and irreversible instability in the global climate system. So if we think from a long-term perspective, it is clear that there is no trade-off between emissions reduction and fiscal sustainability. Uh, the cost of inaction is much greater than the cost of action. We can only have sustainable economic growth and sustainable fiscal positions if we successfully reduce global emissions. So given the large investment needs that, that this entails that uh, Professor uh, Pisani Ferry mentioned, um, how can governments afford the bill while preserving fiscal sustainability. The way I think of that is that it is not really possible <laughs> for the government uh, to foot a very large bill forever. The lion's share of the investment has to come from the private sector and governments should focus on providing enabling conditions for that to happen. So in, in, in recent uh, research we did that the IMF on, on uh, European climate policies we try to develop a concrete package uh, of proposed policies uh, that would make an ambitious reduction of emissions possible while at the same time preserving economic growth and political stability. And, and we really focused on, on modeling the policies very carefully uh, just to make sure that they're consistent with, with fiscal sustainability. So I will put back on the table uh, what, uh, uh, what the, our uh, moderator um, said is difficult to do, but, but, it, but in, my, in, in, in my view, it is, it is a critical element of a sustainable package. And it is that we economies like uh, governments have to put on the table a price for, for carbon emissions. It is impossible to achieve these goals without putting the right price on emissions. And uh, what, what we had in mind is a uniform uh, price covering all sectors, which increases predictably over time. We don't need to increase it overnight, right? But as long as we have a pre-announced path of increasing prices, this would be sufficient to induce uh, the necessary behavioral changes in, in private agents. So the second element of the package is to provide an enabling environment for green investment. Even with the right carbon prices, uh, we know that government support is critical to accelerate green investment, especially where externalities and network effects are large or where liquidity constraints are binding. And the third, probably the most critical element is to, to ensure a just transition uh, so that those that are most affected uh, by the climate transition are protected and supported and therefore you know they they, they in turn support the transition so uh, by modeling very carefully the economic effects of, of, of this policy package we find that it is possible to to achieve uh, Europe, uh, Europe's 2030 climate goals uh, with balanced fiscal policy and with uh, relatively minimal growth effects so let me go through the, through the elements in turn. Um, so again, I'm probably um, you know, preaching to, to, to the converted, but I wanted to go in some detail why we think that carbon pricing is important. And, and I fully acknowledge it's, it's a politically difficult policy, but, but, but why it is important to, to find a way to, to introduce it in, in the policy package. And, and the reason is very simple. It, it promotes the full range of mitigation responses, both on the demand and, the and on the supply side. So emissions reduction is achieved at, at the lowest possible cost. Uh, just as an example, uh, subsidizing renewable energy, which many governments have done successfully in the past, right, in, in, uh, for solar and for wind, uh, 
uh, it provides incentives for people to switch to renewables, but it does not provide incentives to switch from coal to gas, for example, which would still significantly reduce emissions. Or, or it does not provide incentives to reduce energy consumption more generally. If you have high prices on carbon emissions, that would provides incentives both for reducing energy consumption and for switching to a lower emission energy sources. And if we compare pricing to, to other policies, let's say regulations or standards, uh, those latter policies cover only a subset of activities, while carbon price, pricing provides incentives for businesses and consumers to, to decide what is the optimal way to reduce emissions. Uh, considering all of their actions and all, all, of, all of their options, or it, like in technical terms, it equalizes the marginal abatement cost across all activities in the economy. Carbon pricing has another very desirable feature as well, and it is that it produces fiscal revenue, which is an important uh, element in the current environment of rising debt and, and tighter fiscal constraints. Um, so in the simulations we did in the paper, uh, just to put some numbers on the table, increasing carbon pricing to around 100 euros uh, per ton from current levels uh, will result in additional fiscal revenues of about 1% of GDP. It, it, it is not much, but it is, it is uh, still a significant uh, amount. So I want to emphasize again that it is not necessary for, for prices to, to rise overnight. What is important is to have a pre-announced path of rising prices or, or other price floors uh, possibly, which cover comprehensively greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. So thinking about uh, the European context in particular, what would be the best way in practice to implement uh, comprehensive carbon pricing? If one, if one starts from scratch, uh, if we just focus on a country which hasn't had any carbon pricing so far, maybe the best way is to have a simple tax on carbon emissions um, because a tax can be combined uh, relatively easily with, with other policy instruments. However, in the EU context, carbon pricing is mostly done uh, through the uh, ETS currently. So the system works, it is well accepted. Uh, so, so it is probably best to retain the system and just expand its coverage to more sectors. An alternative is to complement the ETS with national carbon taxes, which you know, can be set to, to rise gradually to the ETS price. This is already being proposed and implemented in Denmark, Germany, Ireland, and, and considered in other countries as well. So in addition to expanding the coverage of the ETS system, it would be desirable to uh, strengthen it to incorporate a more clear price signal. Uh, one way to do that is by setting a carbon price floor and, and within the existing system it can be done by linking the market stability reserve to prices instead of quantities. So, so the market stability reserve is triggered if the price falls below a certain level. Uh, having a carbon price floor will provide a predictable signal for private investors something that is in a way currently missing from the system. Um, I mean, it, it, it is there to some extent, right? For example, uh, after adopting the new uh, 2030 goals last year, the implied ETS price immediately increased for the coming couple of years. Uh, but, but there's still significant uncertainty around the price level. And um, of course, in addition uh, to, to thinking about the, the price itself, it is very important to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies and to gradually phase out the free permits uh, uh, in the ETS system to, to provide a clear price signal. And at an individual price, uh, in, at an individual product level, like there, there are some sectors where price sensitivity is very low, for example, the transport sector. So, so at an individual product level, governments can use um, what we call fee baits to strengthen the price signal further. Fee baits are sliding scale fees, which can be positive or negative, on products which have greater or smaller than the average emissions. They're actually widely used for uh, automobiles already in, in, in the UK and, and in many European countries. They can be made revenue neutral, 
So there is no burden on the average buyer or they can be set to, to generate positive revenues. Okay, so, so I hope I, I made the case for, for uh, uh, having a price signal. So let me move to uh, really what is sort of the topic of this, section, of this session, which is uh, how to provide an enabling environment for, for green investment without breaking the buck. Uh, so a pre-announced rising path of prices would already create str very strong incentives for private agents to invest. So there would be less need to spend public resources. However, even with the right carbon pricing, in many cases, uh, government support is critical to accelerate green investment, especially where externalities and network effects are large or liquidity constraints are binding. Examples of public investment which are needed to address network externalities include investment in public charging stations for, for electric vehicles, uh, upgrading power grids to support electrification and cleaner energy generation. Uh, public support may also be needed to promote innovation in, in less developed and not yet profitable uh, renewable power sources, such as offshore wind, hydrogen technologies, and uh, carbon capture and storage. Uh, and and there are areas where liquidity constraint constraints uh, uh, exist, even if uh, the investment is um, would pay for itself in the long run. For example, in the retrofitting of, of homes, and and their governments can support private investment through low cost loans or or means tested subsidies. Front loading the investment, uh, as the EU is currently doing uh, in the resilience and recovery fund. Uh, is, is really a, a great policy. It would help countries recover from the recession and build a, a sustainable future. And even within uh, this, uh, the, uh, the resilience and recovery funds, the, um, the amounts are significant. Uh, Spain, for example, has uh, about 2% of GDP in grants alone that uh, it, um, it can spend on, on, on green investments. From, to, to ensure fiscal sustainability and to ensure acceptance of future government spending on, 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 on green investments, it is critical that funds to be, uh, should be used wisely and spent on productive projects with, with close oversight uh, by the EU and, and by the governments. Uh, good use of the funds will help lift growth which in turn will improve public acceptance of, of climate policies and to make the public more willing to, to pay for it in the future in, in um, uh, you know, with, with, with rising carbon Could prices. Close, 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 please. Sure. The third policy element is to support a just transition, but since our third speaker will focus on it, I, I will just emphasize that it is a, a, a very important um, topic. So let me just summarize. Uh, Fiscal sustainability and climate action can go hand in hand if governments support growth through wise and productive green investments, which correct market failures and help unlock private investment. Pre-announced rising carbon prices will set the right incentives and help pay for them, and the revenues should be used to compensate the most vulnerable and ensure broad acceptance, and also to invest productively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dora. That was really stimulating and interesting and also very complimentary to what Jean said. I mean, I'm already seeing a bit of a different line, one emphasizing more uh, fiscal policy steering and one emphasizing more perhaps a kind of more bottom-up market decentralized uh, approach. I mean, notwithstanding along an adjustment path. Uh, and now we, we shall turn straight away to uh, uh, Linus to, to try and uh, tell us among all these different potentially optimal economic solutions, which one might be made more or less acceptable to the public? He'll, he'll offer some thoughts and then we'll open up uh, to Q&A. Thank you, Linus, please. Yes, hello, I hope you can hear me. Uh, very pleased to speak to you this afternoon. Um, my talk's a bit different in two ways. The first one is that I use slides, so let me share my screen. Um, So I hope you can now see my screen and my cursor. Yes. And then the second way in which my talk is a bit different is more about content because I work as an economist. I do research in climate change economics. 
And now many of you will probably heard um, talks where the climate economist sells you the price on carbon as it is efficient, etc. And um, I'm very glad I didn't need to do that, especially because uh, Dora just summarized the state of the art thinking about that very well. So I didn't have to do it again. Let me just sort of open my talk by saying actually the problem with that is that almost nobody except us economists where I would include myself and her see this in this way almost everyone else sees carbon pricing quite differently so my talks about what does the public make of it and can we feed that back into the policy recommendations and so I brought you this picture to say while I don't disagree the carbon pricing is good economics and we should do more of it in the mind of the politicians, probably there's more of, of a picture like as you're seeing now, where surely, um, you know, good scholarship on political economy has elaborated how industry concerns will influence politicians through classical lobbyism. But I believe in economics and political science, the perspective how citizens perceive policies such as carbon pricing and other climate policies is still understudied. And of course, citizens are not uh, you know, all uniform, we know they can be very different depending where they're living and or depending how much income they, they have. So that's the motivation. And I will argue that um, as we're trying to deliver on the European climate targets, the Green Deal, we do need to take into account that we have to prioritize public support because it's, you know, a, a carbon price as efficient and equitable as it might get is beautiful. Uh, but it's little use if it can't be implemented in practice. And so here I, I, I would criticize a little bit my own profession of economists to say some of them in earlier times have sort of produced spectacular political failures around carbon prices. Um, the carbon tax in Australia is often mentioned for this reason that it was economically beautifully designed, but not sort of with the eye on the actual politics on the ground. Similarly, there's a discussion why it is so hard to pass a carbon tax in the very liberal US state of Washington, where they had two failed referenda on different carbon tax designs. So uh, apparently it is impossible even there to do it by a referendum. And you can argue that the Friday for Futures movement as uh, um, successful as it was politically in Germany in the end only achieved a fairly low carbon price. So when I talk just to fix ideas again about a carbon pricing proposal in which follows, I mean, not only raising the price on carbon, but also what to do with the revenue potentially to, to convince citizens. And so this is a political economy conference. So from that perspective, I think the first point to note is to say, uh, what did countries actually do with the revenue recycling on carbon prices in practice? So here you see a number of constituencies that had a more largely successful carbon prices in the past. There are others that are not in this chart. And I do wish to stress that all the countries who did a successful carbon tax reform and who raised the price of carbon used the revenue recycling quite strategically to mitigate the domestic distributional conflicts. So you see that, you know, this is a bit different from country to country, but all of them in a way, you did some direct revenue recycling to households and to firms, and some of them also to government spending. And there are some examples past 2018 that, that are not on this chart, but that are similar. So I wish to point out, this is not only carbon tax, it's also carbon price. I wish to point out an important difference in this between carbon taxes and emissions trading. So in this chart, you see that for carbon taxes, there seems to be more of this in political reality going on, where you see a higher share of the revenue from carbon taxes is recycled to households and to firms directly. While for emissions trading, as far as the permits are auctioned in the emission trading, you see a large share of the revenue is recycled as green spending. Now, I think it's an interesting gap in research to say we actually don't really know, we don't have good studies to say what do our citizens think of emission trading proposals with quite a good and largely developed literature on what do citizens think about carbon taxes, but we don't really know for emissions trading. And although the dominant opinion in current environmental economics is that there are arguments why carbon taxes are better, there could be an argument to be developed that the emissions trading is actually sort of speaks to a broader concern or to a broader constituency uh, of citizens. My colleagues and I have identified uh, some stumbling blocks, you could say, from behavioral science, why exactly a carbon tax is not all that popular with citizens. Let me, in this short talk, just give you uh, the bottom line, the summary, which these four are. First, quite obviously, um, liking a carbon price proposal is obviously a function of your political and cultural beliefs and, and ideologies, I might add. 
Second, the revenue recycling is especially important because the effective of a Peguvian tax is often ignored by citizens. Citizens just don't find it intuitive that the price and pollution itself will already reduce pollution. And this is how earmarking the revenue specifically, not just generate, not just directing it to general uh, government budget, can enhance public support. So the policy is more transparent. Third, you shall, you, you shall not call it a tax in public, sort of if it's the identical policy instruments, people like it more if it's called a contribution or a fee rather than a tax. And fourth, there's this old political economy lesson to say successful reforms uh, work if the costs are diffused and the benefits are concentrated. Now for carbon pricing, this isn't easy, but part of what might help is to say that we can make the benefits more salient. Happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, here, let me give you next the main lesson we could really say um, there is on this from uh, political science rather than behavioral science and a political scientist might add to what I've just said that carbon pricing or environmental taxation more generally does seem to presuppose quite a lot of trust in politicians, trust in institutions. So in this picture you see um, a generalized measure of public trust in politicians uh, against the carbon price um, in these countries. And although it's suggestive, there is um, more uh, statistical evidence behind it to say, well, it seems like um, high carbon prices uh, tend to happen in countries where political trust is quite high. France is a bit of an outlier, happy to discuss that later. Um, and But I do think for Europe, at least, the chances of doing more carbon prices are rather better than other things, because here we have higher levels of trust compared to other world regions. But there is this, this trust is required, because if there is no trust in politicians uh, dealing with the revenue well, then carbon prices can just, well, will really just come across to the population as another way to squeeze money out of citizens, right? So that's sort of the, the, the prejudice if there's low trust in, the government, in, 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 um, in governments. Um, so um, my uh, next to final point is to say, uh, well, country context matters. Let me give you two results from recent research on it and to say how France is a little bit uh, different from Germany in, in this uh, debate, where an important paper by my colleagues uh, Thomas Duen and Adrien Fabre from last year showed, um, sought to demonstrate motivated reasoning in French citizens to say, you know, they tested what do the French think of the archetypal carbon pricing policy to have a fee and dividend, so a carbon tax, and then you redistribute the money lump sum to citizens. Everyone gets a check in the mail, everyone gets the same amount. And so they found that the French citizens do not like this policy, but rather that they overestimate the negative effect of the scheme on their purchasing power, wrongly think it's regressive, it is actually a progressive policy as a package, and that they do not perceive it as environmentally effective. Now, my own study for Germany, and Germany has a new carbon tax or carbon price on the non-European emission trading sectors starting this month, now at 25 uh, euros per ton, and it increases over the next years. So my study finds on Germany, actually sort of looking at this more from a fairness angle, Germans uh, like this idea of fee and dividend a lot better than the French, and especially those with more conservative political views and not so much interested in climate change anyway. They kind of, to that, to them, this comes across a little bit more positively when you highlight the expect, oh, you actually get money back here from the government. So country context matters in this. Um, and while the research I've done um, might perhaps uh, provide a, um, a framework to guide these revenue choices. So in the studies we have, we go through various options to say, well, starting with is actually your citizenry's perception of, of carbon price is quite negative for a start. And then you go sort of left and right in this decision tree. I can't walk you through the options here for the time constraint. Um, and that is in our papers, and I dare say this has interested already many policymakers across the European Union in the past two years to say how are they going to go about, about their own national carbon tax reforms. So let me summarize. Um, I try to get across the main message. While economists find this intuitive, many citizens ignore simply the idea that the price of carbon actually reduces emissions. And the, although they might care about climate change, this is why this policy doesn't come across so favorably. I don't think 
this should lead us to say we should give up on carbon prices, especially in the European countries where there's more scope for real policy making for more arbitration. I do think this means we have to design our carbon tax reforms with, a, with an eye on how does this come across to the public, where there are two main ways to do it. One is visibly spend revenue of that on the environment, so that ties well in uh, the, the topic of this session to say how we're going to fund the public investment needs. Um, if it's green funding, people might appreciate, well, okay, you, you tax uh, some of the money um, and, and you just use that to finance that. Or you could do a direct and salient redistribution to vulnerable groups. I emphasize again, this direct redistribution, redistribution makes carbon pricing pr progressive, but you shouldn't call it a fee or a contribution. And this is carbon taxes. There's not so much known about how citizens perceive emission trading. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry to go a little bit over time. Thank you so much, Linus, for bringing in this really wonderful research into play here.